And off. I am. Yeah. <laughs> right. <coughs> Last week, we started a three-week study of the armor of God, and we looked at the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. So these are all important. These are two important things we need to look at. And tonight, we'll be looking at two more pieces of the armor, <coughs> and the third piece is the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then we'll have a look at the shield of faith. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. Just check. <laughs> and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, I think we've all heard the saying, <coughs> you don't have a leg to stand on. Mm. Well, in this case, we got plenty to stand on. A solid, good foundation that cannot be kicked away. By using the preparation of the gospel of peace to cover our feet, Satan, the enemy of our soul, will have no chance of ever kicking our legs out from under us. Believe me, if he gets a chance to kick your legs out from under you, he'll do it. And he'll do it in the most painful and brutal way that he can. And when you're down, he'll continue to stick the boot in you. <laughs> he'll have no mercy on you. Don't think he will. With all his experience, he, he knows quite a lot of ways to hurt you. And he'll delight in doing it. Just remember, he'll have no mercy not one bit. <coughs> now, the expression, shoes of the preparation, the gospel of peace, is sometimes shortened to the shoes of peace or the shoes of the gospel. But that's not a good idea because, as we'll see, the whole phrase is important. So we'll be having a look at what the meaning of the preparation of the gospel means, but first we need to look at the shoes themselves. So, to <coughs> like during the time of the Apostle Paul, the shoes worn by the soldiers of the Roman Empire were called Caligae. I hope that's what the name said. <coughs> now, these shoes were designed to keep the soldiers' feet healthy during the rigors of long forced marches. And they were very different from the sandals worn by most of the population. These shoes were solid. They were constructed from three layers of leather. These were pulled up and laced around the ankle. As you can see, the different ones have been there, but never mind. I got the nice lucky ones. You got the posh ones. I got the posh ones. You got the posh ones. <laughs> so the Caligae helped protect against blisters and foot diseases. Mm. In addition, there were small spikes or iron pop nails driven <coughs> into the soles of the shoes in order to give firm footing on an even ground. If you match now the soldiers as marching one behind another and the shoes were solid, didn't give a grip. Every so often as you march, one of them went, oh, 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 that. That's what <laughs> happened. And if all them spent, they would fall. I know, it wouldn't look good for the Roman army, would it? So the whole group would just fall over. And in just the same way, when you, whether you take part in spiritual warfare or not, you may slip in such a way that allows Satan to bring the church down, mm -hmm. or to damage it, certainly. So keep yourself on the straight and narrow, and make sure you've got these shoes on. Those are soldiers <coughs> shoes. They formed the foundation of his armament. In those days, we're talking two, two and a half thousand years ago, the foot soldiers of the Roman Empire relied on walking as their main method of transportation. 
So the ability to move easily and comfortably was for them a necessity. In fact, it was like that. They needed to be able to move about without thinking where they placed their feet. They needed solid footing in order to concentrate on the battle they were involved in. The hobnails <coughs> on their shoes made it easier to hold their ground or navigate through difficult terrain, walking across field hills. <coughs> and you know some fields haven't been ploughed for years. You know what it's like, they can go walk across them in the past, or across the mountain and stones and dips and everywhere. It can be awkward. Have you ever walked a long way and your shoes wore thin? Blisters develop? <laughs> like Mary, yeah. Fall off the feet. Yep. Blisters develop, walking becomes painful. Mm -hmm. I remember years back, I used to walk to Swansea and back about six times a week. Ooh, and oh. if I didn't have a piece of bed shoes, <coughs> It would, have been, it would have been impossible to walk that far and back comfortably. Mm. But imagine walking swans in back and then having to fight the battle for the mm. twisters. Not good. No. Be sure you got socks on your feet. <laughs> they wore away as well. <laughs> in Ephesians 6.15, Paul uses the word preparation. This the way that he means it comes from the Greek word hetoimasia. I think I see his pronouns. <laughs> Too bad for not. <laughs> and Vine's complete expository dictionary of Old and New Testament words says this. The gospel it's says this about the word hetomasia, that one, in this context. So <laughs> loud. The gospel itself is to be the firm footing of the believer, his walk being worthy of it, and therefore a testimony in regard to it. The Greek Septuagint, translation of the Old Testament, uses the same word, I'm not saying it again, heptoimasia. <laughs> I thought you might say it again. Change your mind. <laughs> to convey the meaning of a firm foundation in Psalm 89 verse 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation yeah, of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. So just as righteousness and justice underpin the throne of God, so the gospel message provides a solid footing that every Christian needs. The gospel mm. of peace provides us with the preparation and the foundation we need to face life's spiritual battles. And not just life's spiritual battles, but all of our battles. Mm. And when you have the peace of God in your life, you can get through any problem, whether it's spiritual or any other problem. So, what is question of everybody can answer it? At least have a go. What is the preparation of the gospel of peace? Learning how to just rest in God. That's one, yeah. There's a few answers to the question, but I came up with one. Anybody else got any other answers? I have, but I've just realised it's in your paper, so I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just went, oh, yeah, I, you think I've copied it? No. It's fine, carry on. <laughs> now, when I was doing my research for this talk, I came across a few answers to this question. And the one that made the most sense to me <coughs> is it's a spiritual shoe designed to aid our movement and our defence. I thought, hmm, yeah, that makes sense. I'll go with that one. Now, to me, the gospel of peace is good news. Yeah. 
This and that. It's good news. God forgives us and then he gives to us. What could be greater news for a helpless human being wallowing in sin going to be damned for eternity? God takes this helpless, useless, weak, stupid human being and fills him with an eternity of glory. That's good news to me. Every, even the problems we see around us, every day of the week, a too thin a veil to tack the dark and the joy of the good news of Jesus. Jesus came, taught God's message, died on the cross for us, rose again, so we can be forgiven and go to heaven. That is the good news. The preparation of the gospel of peace equips us with something to give to people who don't know Jesus. Most people out there don't know him. They just know of his name is a swear word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we have the gospel of peace and we can give it. We can give this gospel of peace, this message of peace to the people out there. Mm. And let's face it, it's badly needed in this world right now. This world's in a mess. There's no sign of it getting better. So, the fact is to the body what the will is to the soul. Oh, nice. Think about it. We go wherever our will takes us. See, as I'm walking now, exactly the same thing, isn't it? Mm. People, I think, that includes every one of us, set their mind on doing many things. Some climbed Mount Everest, thinking, yes, I've done it! One of that elite fool. And others then have fought long, hard wars because their mind has been set on these things. Others then be set on digging a garden. Mm. Or, I don't know, walk into a certain place and back. They've done it. But the gospel sets the will of the Christian. It gives mm -hmm. us a purpose. It gives us a focus. It presents us with a message and a task. It gives meaning to life. Mm -hmm. And when you get that, nothing else seems to matter. There's no calling without the gospel. No sacrifice without an understanding. When the will and heart are prepared, ready to serve Jesus, the Christian's feet are shod. They are, pre they are prepared and equipped to face any trouble you must go through to complete the task ahead. Now Paul, as we all know, was an evangelist, an apostle. He was going around preaching the word of God, he was setting up churches. And he was convinced that there was nothing that could separate him from the love of Jesus Christ. He understood this love. He knew the good news. And no bad news of any kind could ruin it. And the time he'd spent preparing himself in the Word when he first became a Christian was bearing fruit during times of trouble. That's why we need to prepare ourselves while we still can. Because trouble's on the way. And make no mistake, it's coming. And it's, start, it's already started. But things are going to get much worse than they already are. Now, a solid belief and grounding in the gospel of peace brings hope to a Christian's life. That hope should keep us unmoved and moving in a straight line towards our target. Our target should be, there's Jesus, I'm going to keep on going, heading that way, no matter what, no matter what gets in the way, I'm going to keep going to him, him. No matter what hurdles are put in my way, I'm going to Jesus. He's there, that's where I'm going. Mm -hmm. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 to 23. And you, who once were alienated 
and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless, and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now, the enemies of the Roman Empire, they had a target as well a focus on bringing down the Romans. And let's face it, the Romans were cruel. To, to crucify somebody, you've got to be cruel and have no mercy whatsoever. Mm. And the enemies of the Roman Empire sometimes placed sharp, spiked objects on the ground in front of them before battle. So any attacking soldier not wearing shoes, substantial enough and solid enough for the attack, would soon find himself crippled or killed. And though the shoes were not by any means the most well-known part of the soldier's armour, they were still vital all the same. Mm. And it's true, the same is true where the armour of God is concerned. Our enemy, Satan, the devil, will use every opportunity <coughs> you give him to litter your path with distractions, traps, hurdles, problems, anything. And it's only the shoes of God, as part which he has given us as part of his armour, can give us the protection we need to keep moving safely across the battlefield. Because the Christian life is a battle. Once you become a Christian, you're attacked by Satan. No two ways about it, you are attacked by him. He's looking. Other people, he's already got them, but a Christian, he hasn't got you anymore, and he's looking for every way to get you back. So, we keep our minds focused on the word of God, the gospel of peace. And at the core of everything, we have the gospel, the good news, the proclamation and the promise of the kingdom of God. It's real. It exists. And Jesus is coming soon. The gospel message is at its core a message of the peace that will envelop the entire world when God establishes his kingdom on this earth. And when we wear that gospel of peace, like shoes on our feet, it provides us with a preparedness, a firm foundation. And that allows us to keep a sure footing in life's more difficult moments. There's a famous quote, its origin is unknown. And it goes like this. If you're going to talk the talk, yeah. you also have to walk, walk the walk. walk. Yeah. How many times have you seen people who say it all, they don't follow it up? Mm -hmm. The next version that could be put up or shut up. Yeah. It's also a case in spiritual warfare. Put up or shut up. So prepare yourself to follow Jesus, no matter what happens to you. And this is not the grasping of doctrines, but mainly the laying hold of the love of God. Question for you. Oh, Ooh, yes. <laughs> Are you prepared to serve God, no matter what? Another one. Are you prepared to acknowledge Him, no matter what? Mm even to the point of death. I hope so, but can we say it? <laughs> Wayne, answer that question yourself. Yeah, you can. If, I think it would depend on commitment, because 
the way I see it is, Jesus died for us. How could we say no, no. to him? And anyway, if you die as a martyr, you know where you're going. Mm -hmm. And you have a martyr's crown. Yeah. So why would you say no? What's the most they can do? Kill the body. He's going to die anyway. Exactly. Exactly. But I'm 58 now. Oh, oh man. I know. Oh, God. <laughs> if I... If I live till 80, well, that's 22 more years, yet, may I say no? <laughs> if I live till 80, it's 22 more years, and my health would deteriorate. So if you say two or three years' time, I was a martyr, well, great, I've gone with my health to a certain point intact, and I'm not there. Okay, tell me if you're not good. <laughs> Not the spirits were the first this week. I say, I hope I can. That's all I can say. I'd like to think I would. I think you would. No when you ask, and I think you would. Our body is only our body is only a vessel that carries on a half of the soul. Yes. Exactly. Carry, yes, because it's it doesn't belong to that. us. We're just we're just a rented vessel of our God. This does yeah. not belong to us. No. So why don't we just give it up to him? Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, there's no point because this does not belong to us. We're here for him. This because all this belongs to him. My body, my body back in the it was like so I'm not God gives us words to say, it says as well. Exactly. So Jesus died for us. How could we say, No, I'm not dying for you? Mm-hmm. That's my take on it. If God wants me to go lay my life down for him, I will do it. Mm -hmm. Where there is... Exactly. Where there's six months or now, a year, two or three years, I would, I would do it. If you ask me, personally speaking, I would say yes. <coughs> so, if you... What I would suggest is, <coughs> if you have doubts as to whether you would do it, see God's face more and more and more. Yeah. Develop that relationship with yes. Him. Mm. So you can say, I'll do it for you. You'll just go like that, yes. If God said, would you be a martyr for me? you just go, yes. Yeah. So you'll have no doubts, no hesitation. <coughs> You won't even have to think the bread. Anyway, so what is the gospel? Truth, the word, the truth. What does the word gospel stand for? Good news. Isn't it? Spot on. So <coughs> make sure you understand the message of the gospel that we are taking to the world. <coughs> Whether you're a singer, writer, or teacher, makes no difference. We all have one message and focus, and that is to spread the love of Christ. <coughs> and this is something every one of us has to do. Prepare yourselves. As scripture says, 2 Timothy verse 4, or chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word. God. Be in stuck <coughs> in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. A long suffering doesn't mean oh I'm suffering, I'm having a hard time. It means patience. It's the word they use in old English. So I suppose sometimes when it could be uh, could be long suffering, could have patience for some people. We need a lot of that. Not with me, though. Well, yeah, you're the most. <laughs> you don't get left out, me. You tell him, Ellen, go, go. <laughs> so, increase your knowledge of the Bible and whatever ministry God has called you to serve him in. Mm. <coughs> Pray every day. And the more time you spend in prayer, the better. You yeah. develop a close yes. relationship with God. You even feel his presence around you 24-7. The more time you spend in prayer with him, the far better you'll be. Take my word on that, right? 
I've done it and I can feel his presence everywhere. Mm. As I do, I asked God once, um, because I'm really sort of hooked on the revival, I, I was listening, to, uh, reading about one, I think it was the Sousa Street Revival, 1906. Yes. And there was one man there, and he asked, <coughs> he asked God, how, how long should I pray every day? So I'm praying three hours. God said seven hours a day. So this man did, then revival broke out. So I asked God, how oh, many, how much do you want me to pray? So he said to me, just pray as much as you can. So whether that's all day, if I, if I walk home now tonight, wait, pray. Walking up here, pray. As much as I, that's what he said to me, for you it might be different, isn't it? Mm. If I walk up to town tonight, pray. You can get a not in the relationship developing. Right, exactly. Yeah. Keep on praying. And the more you study, the more you understand the meaning of the gospel, yes. the more you realise you can trust God in every way. That's the preparation of the shoes of the gospel peace. Yeah. Now, that brings us to the shield of faith. Yeah. Anybody got any ideas what the shield what the shield of faith is? Well they used to protect them, didn't they? Especially if there's the loads of them, they put them all together and they stand firm. <coughs> That's why you think the Romans did, yeah. The tall toys. Yeah. Anybody got any ideas what the shield of faith is? So it's the darts coming, uh, fairy darts and things coming in. That's right, yeah, it is, yeah. Well, Paul talks about the shield of faith in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 68. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. <coughs> now, it's likely that they weren't darts, they could play darts, you go, 180! They weren't like that. <laughs> These darts had heads, which were made of lead. And in or around them, the, the people making the darts would place highly flammable materials. <laughs> I would be 180. Yeah, <laughs> we don't bow this. So, <laughs> <coughs> now, enemies used to shoot these darts or arrows into houses or ships in order to burn them down. The arrows were designed to stick in the shields and to set them on fire. Really? <coughs> the soldier carrying the shield was forced to throw the shield away because it was burning, it was no good to him. He threw it away, he became defenseless. And Satan's temptations are like these burning arrows. But <coughs> these burning arrows are evil thoughts. It's pushed it to the person's mind. Have anybody ever had a thought and suddenly thought to themselves, that's not my thought, how was that in my head? Yeah. Many times. I've had that. Many times. They, they put thoughts into your head. They're clever. They don't say, you think this. They say, like, um, or they don't say, you don't want to go to church this morning. They say, <coughs> I don't fancy going to church this morning. You think there's your thought. But they put it in your mind. Or you suddenly think, how did I think that? That's not me. I don't believe that. I wouldn't do that. How did that thought come in my mind? What do we mean? What do we do? Exactly, yeah. Well, that's a bad Good example. We were in community centre, and I felt that, and I had a voice in my head, we don't really want to go to church today. That's, that's why when, when I came to bed. church, I had prayer, and as you know, after church, I was much better, I was chasing you around. I remember that, yeah. I was really poor when I got there, and I said, <coughs> hey, you don't want to go to church, do you? You're not well. Exactly. So, these arrows 
these darts, balls, can be compared to arrows because they become Evil. suddenly, mm. swiftly. They become thick and fast. They just don't stop. They might be numerous. And where they stick <coughs> can be very troublesome because it cause, they can cause a lot of pain, <coughs> a lot of grief, a lot of hurt. Mm. And they're called burning because they serve to set the light to passions into acts of transgression, which is called against God's will. And things such as lust, anger, revenge. <coughs> to excite your soul into sin then. As you take hold of that thought, if you, take, if you don't take hold of it, it's not a sin. But if you think, I'll do that, and you go and you do it, you're taking hold of that thought, and you're doing it, whatever that thought is, then it becomes a sin. And if these, not, if these thoughts are not repelled, they can bring damnation to hell. Not if you're saved, but if, they, if Satan finds a need to, he sends these, these uh, fiery darts and arrows into somebody unsaved to keep them away from church. Mm. So remember that God is our shield of faith through our faith in Jesus. And this faith, this shield, will quench any dart of the devil. When they pass through your mind, they never make you passionate about doing something bad. Mm. You can catch them with a shield of faith, blunted and extinguished. The darts are coming out of you, lift the shield up, boom! I'm not having that. Mm. In just the same way, God's word is a shield against false doctrines and the schemes of Satan. Mm -hmm. Now, the Roman shield itself, or scatum, if that's the way it's pronounced, <coughs> was a central part of the soldier's defense. Well, the scutum of the first century was rectangular in shape and rounded on the ends. And it was typically made from two sheets of wood, glued together, then covered with canvas and leather. And the canvas and leather would be soaked in water to protect against the flaming arrows shot at the soldiers. And it weighed about 22 pounds, which is quite <coughs> a lot of weight to have to carry about with you. Mm -hmm. I have to walk 20 miles, fight the battle, Carrying that with you. I know right tonight. I'm going to sleep. Stick fight the battle. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> it was, yeah, it's a Sally, you can. <laughs> it was about 40 inches high and 30 inches across. And there was a metal piece in the center, across the center of the shield. So it could be used as a weapon to punch and put their way forward. So it was quite big. Mm. And Paul, in his analogy of the Christian <coughs> argument, says that above all, we should be taking the shield of faith. So, anybody going on ideas as to why a shield of faith above all? Why is that the most important thing? To God stop the God. arrows from Satan coming into your head. Yes. Anybody? Anybody else? Any ideas? I hear that in But why did Paul say that the shield of faith is the main thing? Go for protection, I suppose, because that's more protect, <coughs> protect you more than anything else. Yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah. So it's faith, isn't faith it? Is strong. The shield isn't, even though it's called the shield of faith. We think the shield like that. It's faith. faith Ultimately, it's faith. So, to understand why it's so important, we need to understand what faith is. And Luke, was it Luke? I don't know what the Hebrews. Anyway, the author describes it as the real faith, as the realization of something we can't see. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. 
Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. So the word faith in the New Testament is translated from the Greek word, I don't know if this again is the right pronunciation, but pistis, that's good enough anyway. And Vine's complete expository dictionary defines it as firm belief. So faith is an unshakable belief in the promises of God. And Hebrews 11 is the Bible's faith chapter. It highlights men and women who died in faith, not having received the promises of God yet, but having seen them from the distance, they were assured of them. They embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Hebrews 11, chapter 13. These all died in faith, having not... <coughs> These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Their faith, their unshakable faith in God's promises allowed them to overcome <coughs> serpents, attacks, and traps. Mm. If we take Moses, as Hebrews 11, 24 to 26 tells us, he became of age and he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Instead, he chose to be a slave with the people of God rather than enjoy passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And he looked forward to the reward. I mean, it's unlikely that Moses was considered a prince of Egypt, even though Pharaoh's daughter had take, adopted him as her son. Mm. It's unlikely he was considered a prince of Egypt. Well, it was unlikely he was actually a prince of Egypt, but he was likely considered one. So he had a lot of power and authority, yet he gave this up to be a slave with his own people. But Moses still had a shield. Anybody know what that is? Well, what were these rods and chains in it? Nothing left, no. No, nothing to do with stuff. One word, two words, is faith. That was a shield. <coughs> he followed, but God led him, mm -hmm. even when it would have been easier to give up. Mm -hmm. And we can use our faith in the same way, as a shield to protect us from the fiery darts shot at us by Satan and his demons. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Ephesians 6, verse 11. I think you will all know this one. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now Satan has a lot of ways of attacking you. He could even get some, somebody else to do something to you. And if that happens, you need to forgive that person. Mm. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. So if you don't forgive, you're giving Satan a way to attack you. As I said earlier, he will delight in hurting you as much as he can. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 16 uses the word dance. In modern times, 
It could be any kind of weapon that's projected to a distance by the hand, such as a javelin or spear. And some people think the verse refers to bows and arrows because they call fiery, and because that's because of the burning heat produced in the bodies of the people wounded by the darts. I think poisonous darts is a good description of the words somebody might be saying to hurt you, mm. but you least expect it. Those words can hurt, can't they? So we use our shield of faith as a shield against any and all attacks of the enemy. This kind of faith pleases God. It allows us to trust a God we can't see, that he would stick to his promises in the future. And the more we exercise that faith, the more we please him. And we can use the shield of faith when we do spiritual warfare. I remember I hadn't long been doing spiritual warfare when a demon appeared to me in a dream. I was in my kitchen and I didn't know a lot, but instinctively he came at me and put my hand up like that, she did a faith. And then he was keeping a distance, passing me, and <coughs> eventually he had to go past the narrow gap and I was like that. And he was going past me like that. And then he ran off through the door. And I thought, whoa. Found out a few years later in the Bible study with Michelle, people who go to witches, Satanists are attacking a woman, and God said, hold up your hand, it's a shield of faith. Woman than that, the people, human beings couldn't go near this woman. Mm -hmm. So it works. So if you ever know you've been attacked by these people, and they're coming at you, hand out, shield of faith. As long as you believe, they will not be able to come near you. And faith empowers us to overcome anything Satan sends at us. We overcome evil rather than give in to it. Romans 12, verse 21, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So the arm of God allows us to defend against Satan and his attacks. And the shield of faith allows us not only to defend against evil, but to overcome it. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For anyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Jesus faced a lot of temptation and still overcame it. He never gave in, not once. And this should strengthen our faith in God, that he keep the promises he made to us. John 16 verse 33 These things have I spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So the shield of faith enables us to overcome anything Satan does to us, or anything anybody says to us. If you haven't faced it sometime or other, you probably will. It's happened to me with family members saying things that I, can, I didn't understand then, but I can see now were intended to undermine my faith. It never worked. And don't let it happen to you either. We can use the shield to shield each other, not just ourselves. The, Rome, the Roman soldiers in Paul's day were sometimes attacked by a shower of arrows coming upon them from above. Could be attacking a siege in a walled city or fortified hill. And people, the defenders, would be shooting arrows down at them, throwing stuff down onto them. So what they did was they used a formation known as the testing door or tortoise formation. And what they did was they formed a tight square they put their shields above them and around the sides and at the back. That way, whatever was thrown onto them, 
couldn't touch that. It was very hard for something to get through. Now, similarly, it goes in the back and same thing they did. So they were completely surrounded. And the Greek historian Plutarch described the testudo as follows. Just this is the way he described it. But the full armed infantry facing round received the light troops within, and those in the first rank knelt on one knee, holding their shields before them, the first rank, the next rank holding their ears over the first, and so again others over these. Much like the like the tiling of a house or the rows of seats in a theatre. The whole affording sure defence against arrows which glance upon them without doing any harm. Satan's arrows bounce off you and do no harm if we protect each other. Paul spoke of the need for everybody in churches to be joined together, helping each other, very much like these soldiers. Ephesians 4 verse 16 From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So there's one area of the Roman soldier that was deliberately left 